Almighty God. You are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We come this day as your family here to worship you. Like the disciple Mary, we fall before your feet today to anoint you. We come with grateful hearts for all that you have done in our lives. And we thank you for inviting us to follow Jesus. We thank you that you have enabled us to respond. We thank you for your guidance in our lives. So we come in humility before you today to be still, to listen, to be together, and we come to offer ourselves to you. We come to confess when we have spoken without thinking, when we have harmed rather than healed, when we have excluded instead of welcoming, when we have judged instead of encouraging. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy upon us. Hear our prayers today, said and unsaid. In this moment of silence, we bring to you our own thoughts and prayers. So we give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of all that there is. We thank you for all that we are, for all that we have, and for the wisdom that you have given us to pause and reflect in the hope that our words will bless the world around us. We pray that we may know you in this service, that like Mary, as she bowed the knee before Jesus, with a humble heart, so may we also. Hear us now as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen. So many microphones to deal with. <laughs> school holidays, great, fantastic. We all love school holidays, didn't we? Yes. And uh, it's a good time, the sun's shining as well, which makes it even more special. I want to tell you a story. And I've got something with me to help me tell the story. Does anybody want to come out and hear the story this morning and help me? Come on out. Hi Lucy. Good. Good to see you. Hello. How are we all? Yes. Good. Good, that's it. You're doing fine. Okay. Right. I want to tell you a story, and this is a story when I was probably, I was probably Cameron's age. What are you, Cameron? Seven. Seven. I'd probably be about seven. And this is a story when I was growing up. I told you last week how I got lost, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Well, this is a story how somebody saved my life. <laughs> and I was brought up in a small village, and it was around a harbour, and there was lots of water, in a place called Tarbert. Anybody been to Tarbert? <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, you should go. Have you been there? No? No. So, down there, around the harbour edge, when I was a wee boy, I used to run everywhere. Does anybody like running? Me. <laughs> yes. I know you do, Connor, Cameron. Used to run. And you like running too, Lucy. Used to run everywhere. And uh, around the harbour's edge, was a favourite place to run. 
So here I was running one day and I came round near the fishing quay and there are steps going down off the edge, just like that, yes, down to where the fishermen in the olden days would have had the little boats coming in and they were able to climb up onto the, onto the side. I was running so fast, the tide was in, that I didn't see that. And all of a sudden I was dung, 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 right into the water. And the water was away above my head. And I couldn't swim at that age. And I started to try and flap around and, and swim. And I must have been in for some time. Now, if it wasn't for a man across the road who owned an hotel who saw that what was going on, I might not have been here today to tell this story. So this man came across the road and he came into the water. And when I came back up, he caught me by the scruff of the neck, dragged me out of the water and took me home to my mum, <laughs> dripping wet, like that, just like that. And he said, your son was nearly a goner. But uh, I was so thankful, probably not at that time, but I was so thankful to that man because he saved my saved my life. He really did. And I look back now, eh, I'm so thankful. And eh, if I was to see him now, I would say to him, thank you, thank you very much for being there at the right time and being there to willing to come into the edge of the water and pull me out. I want to tell you a story about a man in the Bible. There's a man called, he's got a big name, you've maybe not heard it before, Lazarus. Can you say that name? Lazarus, that's right. And Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they had a little family. They stayed in a little village near Jerusalem called Bethany. Now, Lazarus took ill and he wasn't well. And sadly, Lazarus died. And it was very sad, very sad. And everybody was sad. But Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was busy somewhere else. And when he came to where Lazarus had died, Mary and Martha said to him, if you had been here, Jesus, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus said, leave it with me. And he did something that was amazing. He brought Lazarus back from death. And Lazarus came alive again. Do you think Lazarus was pleased? <laughs> absolutely delighted so Mary and Martha said okay let's have a dinner a meal to celebrate Lazarus coming back and a meal to honour Jesus so at the meal Mary did something anybody know what that is? Come. it's light aftershave this is the woman's version <laughs> it's perfume. It's perfume. Does your mummy have perfume? <laughs> Do you ever try a wee drop one? <laughs> have a wee smell. Is it nice? Yeah. Have a wee smell. And you want a wee smell? Is that nice, Eva? Yeah. Boys? <laughs> nice perfume, Lucy. We smell? Is that nice? Is that nice? This is called eternity. I must have bought this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> what, what Mary did was, when Jesus was there, she had very, very expensive perfume. And as Jesus was sitting, they would have been sitting on the floor like Hardy there in those days. Mary came and she poured the perfume over Jesus' feet and she wiped her hair on the perfume. Now that's strange to us, but that was a sign of Mary saying to Jesus, Jesus, we honour you. Thank you. This expensive perfume which cost lots and lots of money, she poured it all over Jesus' feet as a way to say thank you. Is that a strange story? It's good to say thank you, isn't it? Especially if somebody saves our life, isn't it? And that's why we come to church on a Sunday. We come to say thank you to God for all that he has done for us. Now, boys, you've been very good. Very good. 
And Eva, are you in charge of them today? Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and you're going to go up to the hall shortly. And I think there's activities for you up there. And to the boys and girls down here, it's Ben. Come on, go a wave to Ben. And Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. And there's Abby as well. Okay, that's shy the day. Mm-hmm. So we're going to sing now. We're going to sing a hymn that praises Jesus. And it says, Thank you to Jesus. It honors him. And it's number 481. Jesus is the name we honor. Do you want to go back to your seats? And we'll sing it from there. No, and you go quick. Just watch your wee wire say that's it. from the coffee shop. Afternoon teas will be served on Thursday the 7th and 21st of April at 12.30. The cost is 8.50 per person. Must be booked in advance to avoid disappointment. On these days the coffee shop will be open serving their morning menu from 10 to 12 as normal. And the coffee shop will close at 2pm on Wednesday the 13th of April and shall reopen at 10am on Tuesday the 19th of April. Tonight we have a short time of prayer in the South Hall that you're welcome to come and attend. This is for the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Followed by our Lent Bible study at 7 o'clock and we have been following Jesus' final week and this week we're looking at Mark chapter 14 at verse 43 and following and it's his betrayal and arrest. If you'd like to take part or be part of the Christian Aid Week, 
that we are planning a, an event. We're meeting in the South Hall this Thursday at 7 p.m. Please come along uh, for further information about it. Just to bring to your attention, Holy Week uh, begins with different services in all our churches. Palm Sunday will be at Springfield, Cambridge. Monday will be here on Holy Week, a uh, Cadder Church here. Tuesday, St. Matthew's. Wednesday, Woodhill Evangelical. Thursday, St. James. And on Friday, there's a service at 12 noon at Kem Ewer and also at 7 p.m. at the Community Church. So plenty of services during Holy Week. And uh, if you can get along to some of those, that would be good to support them. But Monday evening is the Cadder service in the church here. Uh, we've got a film night coming off, that's on the 8th of April, the 100 foot journey, and I think tickets are still available for this from the Cadder Fellowship team. The first Monday we'll meet tomorrow at 1.30pm in the North Hall, and there'll be a speaker on Tai Chi as well as making some Easter crafts. And Kirk Session meets tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. in the North Hall. So lots of different things going on. These are the intimations. I can also just say a, a warm welcome to Gordon with us today. Gordon, you finished your locum duties and Gordon's here with us on a Sunday. And we'll be seeing Gordon from time to time getting involved as well in the services. So Gordon, great, great to see you and have you along in church. First reading is from Psalm 138. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. I sing praise to you before the gods. I face your holy temple, bow down and praise your name because of your constant love and faithfulness, because you have shown that your name and your commands are supreme. You answered me when I called to you. With your strength, you strengthened me. All the kings in the world will praise you, Lord, because they have heard your promises. They will sing about what you have done and about your great glory. Even though you are so high above, you care for the lowly, and the proud cannot hide from you. When I am surrounded by troubles, you keep me safe. You oppose my angry enemies and save me by your power. You will do everything you have promised, Lord. Your love is eternal. Complete the work that you have begun. And our second reading is from John chapter 12 verses 1 to 11. Jesus is anointed at Bethany. Six days before the Passover, 
Jesus went to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from death. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped to serve. Lazarus was one of those who were sitting at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took half a litre of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the whole house. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. A large number of people heard that Jesus was in Bethany. So they went there, not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the death. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too, because on his account, Many Jews were rejecting them and believing in Jesus. Amen. Let's ask God to bless these words to us today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may these words be to us a sweet fragrance. May they encourage us. May they help us and lead us. And may they build our faith in you, as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Scientists are of one mind that perils are the product of pain. They tell us that a peril is produced when a shell of an oyster gets pierced by a grain of sand. And when this happens, the oyster fights back. The foreign invader that has entered is covered and a healing is the result. A peril is eventually produced. It is written, no other gem has such a fascinating history. It is a symbol of stress. It is a healed wound. It is an enduring story of a tiny creature struggle to preserve life. What scientists have discovered is that perils are not the product of pleasure, but of pain. They are healed wounds. If there had been no wound, there would be no peril. Some oysters are never wounded, and the men that seek for them throw them back into the sea. This morning, our gospel story is all about Mary. There is something special about Mary in the gospels. Mary, as we discover, was the perfect host. At some point in her life, she let Jesus into her life. Like the oyster, he found his entry, and at some point of Mary's pain, she began to produce a peril. We don't know Mary's full story. It will be a fascinating story when we get to heaven. But what we do know is that Mary loved Jesus. Jesus made a huge difference to her life. Had she been healed? Had she been forgiven her sin? Possibly both. There was a point in Mary's life when she became host to the Son of God. And he touched her life in such a way that Mary was forever changed. 
35 years ago, I was involved in running a youth fellowship. I was a youth <laughs> myself at that time, well, just about. It started from scratch, and within a few years, we had over 60 young people in the village coming along. In a place like Tarbert, that's them all. <laughs> there was one girl that came in her early teens who had recently moved to the village. She was angry. She was a close book. She would not allow anyone to get close to her. That's until Jesus found a way into her life. And suddenly this little oyster produced a beautiful pearl. And this wee girl is now a mature woman with her own family and serving Jesus to this day. God can enter the hardest of hearts in the most unexpected ways and make a huge difference to someone's life. So when we read this story of Mary and her wasteful gesture of giving away precious perfume, remember she has a history. She owes Jesus her life. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are the Bethany family. They were amongst Jesus' closest friends. And Jesus appeared to have visited them often on his way to Jerusalem. This time is his final visit. This is the end of the road. They know that. Jesus knows that. So they host a dinner party in his honour. What an encouragement to the weary Jesus. According to John's Gospel, the day we call Palm Sunday is the next day in the story. And Jesus is about to enter for the last time. So this wonderful meal was given in his honour. And who was sitting at the table, according to John, was Lazarus. A trophy of what Jesus had done. Lazarus, who the week before was dead, is alive and sitting at the meal, eating and feasting. Mary had so much to be thankful for. The disciples were there, and no doubt others. The emotions would be running high. When you look at the life of Mary, and you follow her life in the Gospels, you will find that Mary is always sitting, where? At Jesus' feet. Always. Read the Gospels, and Mary is right there at the feet of Jesus. She is in awe of Jesus. She hangs on to his every word. She is in many ways the perfect disciple. Mary wanted to get close to Jesus. He was in her life. He was her life. But notice how Martha, her sister, serves Jesus in a different way. She's in the kitchen whilst Mary is listening to his every word. Martha works. Mary prays. There is a place in the Christian faith for both Mary and Martha. But when they are found in the same person, then there is great work and blessing to a church. We always need the spirit of Martha and Mary in our churches today working together. But those two women, Mary and Martha, had total faith in Jesus. Total faith. What was the atmosphere like in that house as they all squeezed in together? Remember, they're sitting on the floor. That's how they ate in Palestine in those days. They reclined together on the floor. What was the atmosphere like as they shared the meal? And as Mary comes and breaks open the bottle of the most expensive perfume and pours it over Jesus' feet, Mark's gospel has Mary pouring it all over him, from his head down to his feet. John has Mary pouring it over his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. Mary 
had something about Jesus' feet. And John picked up on this. And in the next chapter of John's Gospel, he tells the story of Jesus washing and drying the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. Did Mary's gesture inspire Jesus? Washing feet may be strange to us, but in Palestine, it was an expectation that the servant of the house would wash feet of the guests. It wasn't unusual for a Palestinian woman to wash someone's feet, as her climate was dry, and so feet became very dusty and dirty. It was a mark of respect and courtesy. But what was unusual was that she used perfume. A year's wage was used. It was interesting in the version that Diane read, 300 silver coins. How much did Judas betray Jesus for? 30 silver coins. 300. I went onto Harrod's website to see what the most expensive bottle of perfume was and if I could buy it for Susan. <laughs> and incredibly, they are selling perfume at £20,000 a bottle. I've seen a few no shakes of the head there. Sorry, Susan, outside my budget. <laughs> Extravagant, audacious, and you may even say wasteful. The scent fills the house, the room, with sweet-smelling scent. John notes this. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. The atmosphere had changed. Mary had changed the atmosphere with her kind act of random kindness. As Jesus was going to the cross, Mary makes his experience a little easier. She was hosting and honouring Jesus. We don't know the history of the perfume. Was it her life savings? Was it an heirloom passed on through generations? But what we do know is that it was rare, expensive, and costly to Mary and her family. But what price would you pay for your brother to be restored from death? How much would you pay to have your loved one sitting at your side? Mary wasn't paying Jesus. She was simply responding to the gift of life and grace. And as she looked across the room, I guarantee she saw Lazarus sitting there with a smile on his face. And I'm sure she knew that this was the right thing to do and it was the right moment. Jesus said of another lady who did a similar act, she loves much because she's been forgiven much. This act of generosity is simply a response to the goodness of Jesus. But it doesn't finish there because she unties her long flowing hair and wipes it on his feet. This was something no self-respecting Palestinian woman would do unless it was someone very close to her, like her husband. No woman's hair would be seen in public outside of the family home, but Mary lets her long hair flow and uses it as a towel to dry his feet. With Jesus, one never knew what would happen next, and this was a special occasion where Jesus said of another woman, wherever the gospel is preached, this story must be told. The house would be silent as the house was filled with that lovely aroma. There were perhaps tears of joy. This was the moment that Mary honours Jesus. This was the moment that her life became a peril of great price. She honours her guest with this dedication service. She is self-emptying herself and making herself totally available to serve Jesus. She is making a statement that she is fully committed to serving Jesus and so serving God. I believe that Mary understood what Jesus was all about better than anyone else in that house that day, and this act shows it. Mary glimpsed in Jesus the self-emptying of God. She saw his sacrifice, 
And so she also gave all that she had to anoint him. It is a beautiful moment in the Gospels, one to be treasured. Rather than savoring the moment, Judas, the treasurer, the one charged with looking after the finances, speaks up. He strongly objects to the waste. He he sees it purely in terms of money. He misses the entire point. A year's wage, wasted in a few moments. This perfume could have been sold and used to help the poor, he said. He was right. Of course he was right. The atmosphere changes in the house when Judas' words are heard, and suddenly negativity creeps into the room. Judas is judgmental of Mary, accusing her of waste, but he's also challenging Jesus for allowing Mary to do such a thing, and within a moment the fragrance that had filled the room had become a foul smell. Judas had changed the atmosphere with a few crushing words, but we will leave Judas for now. This day is about Mary and her beautiful deed. It is a beautiful story. One could almost say it is a love story. Mary loved Jesus in the sense of what he had done for her, and Jesus loved Mary for allowing him into her life. It's a good story for us to focus on Lent. On the day of resurrection, John has Mary standing outside the tomb crying, for she thinks his body has been taken away. She sees what she thinks as a gardener, and she asks him, where have you put his body? And then she hears one word, one word that was to change her world, her name, Mary. That was enough, just her name. She knew his compassionate voice. Is this the same Mary that anointed him just a few days earlier? We are not sure, but Mary from Bethany would not have been far away from the empty tomb. Her task, after all, was to anoint Jesus' body after his death. But that task had already been done in Bethany. We started today with the peril story. Where are we in this story? Have we allowed the grit to enter into our lives? It can enter in different ways and at different times. It could be a time of illness, grief, sadness, loneliness. It can be a time of joy when a child is born and in those existential moments, God enters into our lives. It happens when our lives are simply open to God's Spirit. I invite you today to invite that Spirit into your lives, the Spirit of Jesus, to allow it to shape and mold you and for you to become also, like Mary, that peril of great price. May God bless you today as we journey towards Easter on this fifth Sunday as we worship Him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen.
we come before you, Lord, in dedication, like Mary, and we bring to you our offering. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given to us. And in response of that offering, we give to you our gifts. Whether that's here on a Sunday morning or whether that's done through a, our banks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and use these gifts to support and to enable others to serve you. Loving God, you spoke love into this world. You called each of us by name to know your love, and we thank you. We give you thanks today for the truth and the wisdom shown to us through the life of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus. But we bring to you our troubled world today, Lord, aching under the afflictions of disease, poverty, and war. Help us and all those with the power to do so to speak justice. Help us in your name to bring peace and understanding to all people. And in our prayers today, we again bring the situation of Ukraine. We are shocked, horrified at the scenes that we are seeing. Lord, we pray again for peace as we have been. We were also aware that war and rumour of war is not isolated to one country, but around the world today there is much unrest. We pray for Mary's spirit for our world today, a spirit of love, grace, and humility. As we recognize that there is far too much of the spirit of Judas in our world, a spirit of judgment and negativity. So we bring our words of prayer for our country and community in this time of change. Help us and all those in positions of power, elected and unelected, to shine light into the darkness, hope into the hopelessness, strength and weaknesses, doubts and hopes. Helps us to hear your word and use our words for the good of your kingdom. Lord, bless this church, all its members, who have come through the most challenging of years. Be with them, be with those who are grieving those who have lost, those who are struggling with illness, those who have COVID. O Lord, be near to them, draw close to them. And bless this church, Lord, as we find a way through those challenging times that we are facing within the Church of Scotland, as we negotiate presbytery plans and the like. Help us, Lord. May we trust in your unfailing love and respond to it with grace and humility. As we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
as we go from here, may we go with the spirit of Mary. May we love like Jesus, generously, extravagantly, abundantly. Go now in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen.